University. Our next speaker is Andrew Polstra, who's the Director of Research at Blockstream, and will enlighten us about Schnorr and Taproot, which are proposed upgrades to Bitcoin and the implications of these changes. Andrew, I'll pass the mic to you. There we go, perfect. Um, all right, so yes, uh, my name is Andrew Polstra. I'm the Director of Research at Blockstream, and uh, I'm gonna talk about Taproot. So Taproot is, it's a fairly technical change to Bitcoin um, without a lot of user visible kind of feature things that will, will, will come from it. But it has important implications for both privacy and, and the bigger thing, scalability. So I'm gonna to try to give an overview of this. It's unfortunate trying to talk about something so technical um, in a 20 minute slot like this in, in a conference. It isn't like a, a academic CS conference. Um, but I'm gonna to try to give a, a high level overview of what's going on and, and try to describe why I'm so excited about this and, and why other people should be as well. So let me just switch over to my screen here. There we go. So. Um, so I think I'll start. So the first thing I'm going to do is introduce Bitcoin script. Um, so for those who don't know, Bitcoin has a scripting language built into it, which is used to describe spending policies. And so what I mean by that is when we talk about Bitcoin being held by keys, or when we talk about backing up the keys to our Bitcoins, what's actually going on on a technical layer is that there are coins tracked by the Bitcoin network which are associated to a public key, which in turn is associated to a secret key, which is what people are, are storing and what people are trying to keep secret. And we ordinarily think of Bitcoins associated to keys and not much, um, and not more complicated things than that. But on a technical level, what's actually happening is there's a policy defined on the Bitcoin network, which looks something like these coins may not be spent on this by a transaction that contains a valid signature using this key. And in fact, more general, more complicated policies are possible. You could say, rather than depending on a signature by a single key, you might have multiple keys and your policy might look like you need a signature from both of these keys. Or say you might have a large number of keys, maybe like five or 10 and require some threshold, many of them. You might say that um, seven out of 10 keys are needed to move some coins. When you have these multi-key, multi-participant policies, a very common thing to do is to have a backup policy in the case that whoever your participants are are unable to complete whatever protocol, maybe they have a voting protocol or maybe they're doing part of a payment channel or something. For whatever reason, it may be that not all keys are available. In which case you might have a policy that looks something like say two out of three hot keys are required to move the coins. But if the coins for some reason don't move for a thousand blocks or for a week or two, then an alternate policy comes alive where some backup key, some single key, which is backed up under cold storage guarded by some, some armed guard in a vault in a mountain in an unincorporated area of, a, of an unknown island or whatever you might have, then that key might become active after a certain amount of time. And the thinking is that the three hot keys are realistically always going to be what moves the funds, but if those keys are lost or if the owners of those keys are compromised or for whatever reason they won't participate, then, then there is some recourse. There's some way to recover the coins so they aren't just lost forever. So I'm going to talk a bit in the next slide about what these policies can look like in detail, but on a high level, the important feature is that you have a small fixed set of participants who all contribute keys to a spending policy in Bitcoin. There, there are other things you can do, but in practice, this is basically the only, only kind of policies that you encode are ones where you have a small number of fixed participants. And there's an interesting feature where while script itself, there's an interesting observation, which is while script itself supports fairly complicated ways of deciding under which conditions the coins will move, right? You can require like these keys or that keys. You might require people to reveal a hash pre-image. You might require people find a hash collision or something like that. You might require a certain amount of time to go by before certain parts of the policy become active, whatever. The point is if all of the participants involved in the spending policy agree that the coin should be moved, 
then the coins can move. There's no need for all these complicated negotiating um, or distinguishing rules that Bitcoin script enables you to enforce if everybody involved in the policy agrees. So we have this, this rich policy describing scripting language, but in practice, you always have a small number of fixed participants and it's only needed in case of agreements or disagreements, I should say. So here's an example of a Bitcoin script. Um, and this looks kind of large and intimidating. And the reason is that I took one script and I just like threw every single feature that I could fit into a single script so that I could fit it all into one slide. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this, except to say that one reason that we usually think of Bitcoins as just being associated individual keys is that there isn't a lot of tooling available to work with more complicated policies. And as a means of illustrating that this is changing over the last year or so, we finally started to, to recognize uses for more complicated policies. Uh, there's been better tooling involved. And, and one result of that is that I can have a script encoded like this. So there's still a lot of noise going on here, but you can sort of see on a high level, you can tell what's happening. Um, you've got these two major branches of the script at the top connected by an AND, meaning that both of those sub branches need to be satisfied. If you look just at the left, we've got an OR here, and you can ignore the subscripts and the, and the Vs and stuff. Those are technical things related to the efficiency of how it's encoded on the blockchain. You've got this OR of a pub key, pub key one, and the SHA-256, this requirement that a hash payment is revealed. What this says is that on the left branch here, either the holder of public key one uh, needs to provide a signature, or somebody needs to provide a pre-image to the specific hash. And then maybe this is used as part of some larger protocol. So using more modern tooling, I was able to draw this, this nice picture and I'm even able to do some kind of automated analysis. And in other talks, including ones that I've done at F FCAT, I've gone into more detail on this, but for now, I'm just going to say the script can do a, a good number of things. And increasingly there's tooling available so that you can actually do these large number of things. So when I talk about Bitcoin is not only being associated to keys, but being associated to multi-party uh, protocols or being associated to complex spending policies. This isn't just like an academic thing or a, um, or a theoretical thing that some Bitcoin experts are using, but ordinary users of Bitcoin uh, can't be expected to care about. So I'm gonna switch gears a bit from Bitcoin script and then talk about a bit of a more technical thing called Schnorr signatures. And then I'm going to bring these together and describe what Taproot is, which sort of combines the philosophical aspects of script, which I've been describing with some unique features that can be implemented on top of Schnorr signatures. So Schnorr signatures, these are an alternate, alternative signature protocol to something called ECDSA that many of you are probably familiar with. Schnorr signatures are just a very basic cryptographic building block that associates a key pair, the public and private keys that I'm talking about, uh, to a specific message, or in the case of Bitcoin, to a specific transaction. If you own some coins, then the coin is somehow associated to your key or to a larger policy that includes your key. In order to spend the coins, you have to provide a signature on a transaction spending those coins with the appropriate key. And what that signature looks like is defined by the Schnorr signature algorithm, or rather in Bitcoin today is defined by the ECDSA algorithm. Schnorr is a proposed replacement for this. So it has a few technical benefits. Um, it's slightly easier to implement efficiently. It has a provable proof of security, um, or sorry, an academic proof of security in a proving model that is, is much better justified than the models that are used for ECDSA. And I'm not going to go into the, the details of approval security means exactly, but certainly this gives us a lot more assurance that for theoretical reasons, Schnorr signatures can be expected to be unforgeable in ways that ECDSA doesn't necessarily have. Although I should be clear that ECDSA and Schnorr for that matter have both been deployed for multiple decades in, in many very uh, high assurance, high, reliable, high reliability systems. And there is no, there's no concern in practice that either of these signature schemes might result in forgeable signatures. But when using these schemes as parts of larger crypto systems, then the exact details of the security model that you're working in become important to academics. 
And that's where the sort of fragility or ad hocness of the ECDSA security arguments become a concern. So that's one thing about Schnorr, that's a bit academic. A couple more practical things though, are that with Schnorr signatures, it is very easy um, or easy from an implementation and from a, a security analysis perspective to enable compact multi-signatures. So in the script that I showed in the last slide here, you might count, there are actually four different keys here. Um, so you've got PK1 way on the left and then on the right, you've got these two sub branches. One has PK2 and PK3, the other has PK4. <clears throat> One thing you might do with Schnorr signatures is rather than listing two public keys and insisting that both of them provide a signature, separate signatures on a given transaction, you might actually combine the two public keys into one, which represents two participants. And you're able to do this, and you're able to use a variant of the Schnorr signing algorithm, such that those two parties are able to cooperatively produce a single signature. So the spending policy that this represents is that there are two participants. They have two keys and both are required to sign off to move the coins. But what the blockchain sees is that there's only one key and one signature that hits the chain. So there's a scalability improvement here, certainly, which is that verifiers only need to check one signature from one key. There's also a privacy improvement because verifiers who aren't privy to the original spending policy, who didn't construct the keys themselves, can no longer distinguish between the ordinary case where Bitcoins are stored by a single key and more complicated cases where these coins might be stored um, or might be, be secured by multiple keys. Um, all of which need to be used to spend the coins. And you can even combine more interesting things. You can do like three of five keys. You can do like two of these three keys or five of these six keys or complicated things like this. And again, with Schnorr signatures, you're able to compress even those complicated policies into a single key, which can then be spent with a single signature. And in fact, you can go even further and I'm not going to go into details, but some of the other features that we see here such as requiring pre-images to certain hashes can also be emulated in this one key, one signature model using Schnorr signatures and appropriately complicated off-chain multi-party protocols. So Schnorr signatures give us a lot, of, a lot of power that we can kind of squish into individual keys. In fact, there's a bit more that we can do with individual keys, which I'm going to discuss in the next slide. But before I do that, let me just mention a limitation here, which is that one aspect of script that we know that we can't encode, or rather we don't know how to encode in individual keys is this issue of time locks. So as I mentioned, describing application of the script, you might have branches like on the far right of my screen here, where you have a time lock requirement, where you say, if the coins are older than some number of blocks, then there is some other component of the policy that becomes active. Once the coins are older than a thousand blocks, then a certain key uh, can be used, or perhaps a certain key must be used until a thousand blocks are up, and then that key becomes disabled, as is the case here. We don't know how to do these time-locked um, kind of emergency clauses. So despite what you can do with one key, one signature, there's still a need, even in the presence of Schnorr signatures, to have a complicated scripting system. And so here's where Taproot comes in. So I'm going to bring the, uh, the one equation that I have in all of these slides here, this scary looking thing. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking a key P that you see on the left and I'm transforming it in a certain way. I'm taking this hash, so this H here represents a hash. I'm throwing a key in there. You can ignore that. I'm also throwing a message in there. And then through this equation, I'm actually transforming the key from a signing key which represents an identity who needs to sign off on the transaction to move the coins into a commitment, a commitment in this case to this message M, which in the case of Taproot represents a Bitcoin script. And the result of this tweak is that the key retains its capability as an identity and as something that requires a signature, but it also enables an alternate mode of spending in which a user can reveal a script and they can then satisfy that script. So at the beginning of my talk, when I mentioned that we typically have a situation in Bitcoin script where you have a small fixed set of participants, as long as they all agree to move the coins, they can just move the coins 
And it's only in the case that they don't agree that you need to defer to script, that you need to use these branches and these ifs and these time locks and all of these complicated things. And so this taproot equation that I've written here directly expresses that observation mathematically. And the upshot is that on the Bitcoin network, what you see for any coin that's using taproot is that the coin is represented by a single key. And as discussed, a single key might represent multiple participants. It might even represent fairly complicated signing policies that those different participants need to achieve. But the result is just a single key. And in the cooperative case, when all of them agree that the coin should move to some specific destination, they're able to create a transaction which moves the coins, jointly execute a multi-signature protocol that signs the transaction and sends the coins. The network sees one key, it sees one signature. It's none the wiser how many participants were involved. It doesn't see what the policy was. It doesn't see the number of participants. It doesn't see the identities of the participants. And what's interesting is that this key, which has been tweaked to commit to some script, the network also doesn't see that script or even that there was a script. But in the uncommon, uncooperative case, the participants, any of them, have the opportunity to reveal this script, which may contain a time-locked alternate policy saying that some cold key should now be used to move the coins or saying that the coins may now um, are now in control of some legal entity who's independent of the original contractors or whatever have you. The participants have the opportunity to reveal this script, which hopefully is guarded by a time lock to discourage them, them doing it too quickly. Because if they cooperate, it's better that they use a cooperative path because it's cheaper and smaller and better privacy. But they can reveal this alternate script. The network will then recognize the script. The network can validate that there is this commitment. And it can then check that the script is actually satisfied and that the alternate policy is satisfied. So you have kind of the best of both worlds where in the cooperative case, you have one key, one signature, even for arbitrarily complex policies, even including ones that include complicated features that maybe are not expressible in one key, one signature uh, purely. But in the unhappy case where you actually need to defer to the script, you have an alternate means to do so. And that alternate means is invisible except in the case that is actually needed. So to summarize, this scheme is called Tappert, where we assign to every Bitcoin output a single key, but this key is now able to represent not only uh, a single signer or a collection of signers, but it might secretly contain a commitment to an actual script. So cases where traditionally you would put an actual Bitcoin script on the chain, you now only provide a commitment and the commitment is invisible. In the cooperative case, this commitment remains invisible, is never seen at any point, and nobody is any the wiser how many participants were involved or what, what their policy was. In the uncooperative case, then you have to reveal a script and you have to actually use it. And what we've spent a lot of time working on over the last year or two of development of Taproot is ensuring that even in this uncooperative case, essentially what the system reduces to is the same efficiency and the same scalability properties as the old style scripts. So Taproot really is just a pure benefit in terms of efficiency and in terms of scalability. So that's all I've got. Um, so thank you all for listening.